office and you're, before you even get to your desk and your desk and your boss hits you up and says, hey Mark, I was at this conference last week and I learned about this really cool thing called the Alexa Top 1 Million List. All we have to do is cross-reference our web logs, our DS logs with the Alexa Top 1 Million, anything that's on there, and boom, we're going to know that we're infected. I haven't even had my coffee yet and you're asking me to go through millions of web logs. Sure boss, sounds great. So I'm going to go ahead, oops, yep, yeah, there we go. So I'm going to use an instruction like the top one up here that will go through all 55 gigs of web logs. That's going to take a while. So before I start with that one, I do the second one. If this is some bash kung fu, don't worry, we'll get there. And that's going to go through one gig of logs. So I want to time it and see how long that first gig of logs is going to take. So I go and get some coffee. It's still running. I go and check my uh, tickets that came in over the weekend. It's still running. I go to lunch. I come back. It's still running. And go ahead and let my boss know, hey, this is going to take a while. So I'm going to bail. I'm going to go get some coffee. I'm on my way home from work. Don't worry about it. Come back in the next morning. It's still running. So clearly, this is going to take a while. So if it's been running for 999 minutes so far, 999 minutes times 55 gigs means you're looking at well over a month for this to finish. Clearly, that's not a good way to get a raise from your boss if it's going to take you a month to answer this question. By the way, I did time it out. Uh, approximately three years, 10 months, 11 days, 18 hours, 34 minutes, and 38 seconds to let it run uh, and finish at that rate. So you find a YouTube video called Save Time with Modern Search Techniques featuring yours truly. And then you go ahead and grab your boss's corporate card, which he keeps in that desk drawer that he doesn't lock quite as well as he thought he did, because you're going to go with the lockpick village tomorrow. And thanks to the magic of overnight shipping, Wednesday morning you build yourself a new machine. It takes about 20 minutes to copy all that data over, and of course you're doing it in your office so that you, know, you keep this on the down low. And you go ahead and rerun that. Less than seven minutes, we can get you the data you need using the techniques that we're going to talk about today. Some of you may have thought you heard a, I'll say a speako in my introduction when I said that the boss asked you to find everything that's on the Alexa Top 1 million. Because now you give that report to your boss and he says, no, 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 Mark, you didn't hear me. You hadn't had your coffee yet. I don't want to know everything that's on the Alexa Top 1 million. I want to know everything that's not on the Alexa Top 1 million. So you rerun your script. It doesn't take three years, 10 months, 11 days, 18 hours, and 38 seconds. It takes six minutes. And now all of a sudden you've got the data that you need to go ahead and start to look into that. So you may say, Mark, my sim already cross-references with the Alexa Top 1 million. That's kind of a dumb example. Okay. So the other example here I did is you get a report from your Threat Intel team with about 2,300 bad IPs, bad URLs. You guys ever get these from your Threat Intel group and you're like, eh, how bad are these? You know, when did it go bad? When did it go good? So cross-referencing something like that, 45 seconds. So what's the data set we're working with here? 750 megalogs. Um, I don't know if anyone else uses the term megalogs. I think megalogs and gigalogs sound kind of cool, so I'm going to use it. We'll see if it sticks. Um, so if we're doing 750 megalogs in, four, in three quarters of a minute, that's a search rate of a billion log events per minute. I don't know about you guys, but when I go to customer sites, I've seen plenty of sims that struggle to operate at a billion log searches per minute. What I want to show you guys today is some techniques. These will work with logs. These will work with other data sources. In my experience doing incident response, no matter how good the SIM impl implementation is, you always get to the point where there's data that's not in the SIM. You have to go to NetFlow logs. You have to go to IIS logs. You have to go to Apache logs. You've got to go to NTP logs. There's always something that's not in the sim, and these techniques will help you find that, those answers you need faster. I am not the only person that's trying to do research like this. There are not a lot of people that share large data sets for the purposes of research like this. So if you work in an organization where you can share this, I implore you to share it with the community. 
we're all familiar with a country called Syria. We've all heard that the Syrian regime is doing some things that as technologists, we may not agree with. Some other technologists started poking around in Syrian IP space. They found some FTP servers. They were able to gain access to said FTP servers. And what they found there were logs of web access from the citizens of Syria. This led to the, um, turns out a company was violating some export restrictions. That company no longer exists. Um, as well as some international sanctions. So if you are a despot and you have your own country and you're willing to share that with the community, I would love to get that data. If you don't have your own country but you do work for someone that would share it, please do that as well. Anyway, uh, the other thing we're using is the CERT has a insider threat class and they publish uh, some data sets that they use for training. So I'll be kind of bouncing back and forth between the two. If I don't talk about it explicitly, I'm using the Blue Smoke data set. Okay, uh, GitHub page is also in the uh, lower corner of all the slides, which on the front projectors, I think that's about a 12-inch uh, font. Um, so feel free to hit that up. The PDF of this material is uploaded, so you feel free to follow along. Uh, but let's face it, the screens are pretty awesome in this room, so hopefully that works. Agenda for the rest of the talk, I'm going to be talking a little bit about theory. We're going to talk about some different tools you can use to do this, how you can modify your data to make it work. Most importantly, how you guys can bring this and do this back at home or the office. Uh, we're going to talk about some demos, and I'm going to drop two new tools on you guys at the end. My name is Mark Jean Mugin, or Mark Jamougan, if I'm in Montreal. Um, so I've been working in information security since 2000. I've uh, been doing IT for about 20 plus years, give or take. I love doing the digital forensics and incident response type stuff. Um, I'm happy to talk about some of the academic fraud cases I've worked uh, in a less public setting. And I can fold a fitted sheet. So. As an industry, we have nailed serial code. That code that runs normal, one instruction after the other, we've got that down. You know, think about when was the last time you guys heard about a, a software developer that had to patch serial code? You know, Oracle, they haven't had to do it. Their stuff's rock solid. Microsoft, their stuff's rock solid. Adobe, their stuff's rock solid. And Wes is telling me that Oracle put out some patches recently. It was 300, okay, so maybe, but everybody else, they've got it down, right? No, code is hard. When you go parallel, you literally increase the difficulty by an order of magnitude. This is not an easy problem. That's why we still struggle with it. So there's two types of parallelism. Coarse grain parallelism, fine grain parallelism. If you don't have to think about it in your process, the, your program already takes advantages of multiple CPU cores, that's fine grain parallelism. Rendering programs, handbrake, some of the compression tools, Cinebench, these things all take advantage of however much CPU you can throw at them. What I'm here to talk about is tools that aren't built to take advantage of that, because that's where the interesting stuff happens. So when you think about search, you've got, and this could be uh, searching through a memory image, searching through a disk image if you're doing forensics. This could be searching through a log file. Uh, this could be working with pictures from your camera. You start at byte zero, and you search through the rest of that camera, uh, that image, looking for whatever it is that you're searching for. You have to go through byte by byte and find it in your data. So one way we can make this work is by changing our data. Sounds easy, but what's that really mean? So we want to give that data set to a CPU core and let it search through the data. So let's take a big data set and split it into chunks. So the example here that we're doing, uh, I want to go through this split line, and we're going to start at the right side of this command line. So that very last parameter is an IP address dash a date code dot SPL. That is the output file that split is going to create. The next parameter, again, counting from the right, is our file name. So that's just IP address dash date code dot log. So that's what we're splitting. Our next thing is dash L2 million. So 
think maybe we're going to split 2 million lines. Okay, so that's L lines, 2 million, 2 million lines per output file. Uh, dash D and dash A2. A2 says to use two characters in our suffix, and D is for digits. So our first output file is going to be SPL00. Our next one is SPL01, 02, yada, yada, yada. So that breaks our data up into chunks. Depending on what you're doing with your I.O., you may want to compress these as well to save some disk space. We'll come back to that in a bit. I want you guys to recognize that if you download the PDF, slide 15 has a way to split up a large data set. This is probably a little bit of bash kung fu for some of you guys. So what this is going to do is going to generate ls, a list of all your files that start with http-20 star, and it's going to put those file names one by one into a variable called i, and then we're going to xzcat, which just decompress, oops, just decompresses that data, and then we're going to grep for badsite.org. Evil.com was already taken, so our adversary had to use badsite.org. And then we're going to do a wc-l simple word count or uh, line count to figure out how many hits we had. So that's about seven and a half minutes to go through this particular data set. So we can use uh, exargs to kick this off in parallel. So what we're doing here is p64, so that's 64 concurrent running processes. L8 says take eight file names pass eight file names to one instance of XCAT, eight file names to another instance of XCAT, yada, 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 until you've got 64 running concurrently. And then again, we're going to do our grep for badsite.org. So we just went from a little over seven minutes down to two minutes. I call that a win. That's six minutes early, we get to leave. Okay, maybe six minutes longer to spend browsing Reddit. Uh, I Breakdown slides scattered throughout the PDF, so if you guys are playing along at home, this will describe uh, what I'm covering verbally. XARGs is going to be on every Unix box you've used since the 1970s, or for some of you, every Unix box you've used since, you know, three years ago. Uh, GNU Parallel is awesome. This is new. It may not be every, on every box you use. It is in the Debian repositories. It is in your YUM repositories. Uh, and it's just a, per, a Perl script. So if it's not in a repo for your particular OS, you can just download it and run it. It is one of the best documented Unix utilities I've ever seen. Uh, the man page and then there's a tutorial together are about 100 pages. So if you have trouble sleeping, uh, it is a wonderful, wonderful resource that's been provided by the author. Man-T, probably new for a lot of you guys. What that does is dump a PostScript formatted version of the, the man page. We used to have PostScript printers. We don't anymore. The PS2 PDF command will read that PostScript format and dump a PDF. So if you want to load up a PDF so that you can print it out, read it on the bus, read it on the train, um, make paper airplanes, have a little, you know, whatever, you're good to go. Okay. First of all, this is my cat, Ollie. He's a little slow. He's a, he's a chill kind of cat. So here's my example of the starting base. So this is running through that blue smoke data set, and we're doing a traditional serial search, looking for anyone that's trying to find out information about the new Chalupa, and that takes about seven minutes to go through that data set. Our first step at doing things in parallel, this is my cat, Kaylee, right after she got shaved. I love this picture. Um, so what Kaylee is showing is a much lighter weight way to go through it, and we go from seven minutes to 49 seconds just by running things in parallel. You will notice throughout the slides, uh, some of the text is in bold. For those of you that are used to working at a command prompt, there's no concept of a bold font at the command prompt. I use bold to indicate what is run in parallel. So the lzcat in the search, you get one LZCAT and one grep for each CPU thread that is available from your hardware. And then those are all kicked off and run in parallel. So seven minutes to one minute. I'm impressed. I think that's a pretty big speed up. We can go further. So now we got our first race car picture. 
And what we do here is we include the WC-L in the parallelization. So that saves us about 10% for this particular search. Uh, other searches, this can make a bigger difference uh, if you're working with larger data sets. Now we're up to an IndyCar. We cut another 5% uh, by getting rid of regular expressions. By default, grep assumes that you're searching for a regular expression. Um, I have a more dramatic example of this coming up, I promise. Uh, no one seems particularly impressed that we save 5%. The next one is a, a good example. So, uh, and then we got Sebastian Vettel and his Ferrari up at Montreal, and uh, we cut another 5% by running, uh, so there's a option to parallel, J 110%. So that runs at 110%. So we basically kick off a couple extra processes. And the idea here is that once one process dies, there's already another process in memory ready to take over for that, for that CPU core. You don't have to wait to spin up the process. So we're moving some of that uh, scheduling onto the kernel rather than letting a Perl script handle it. Makes sense that the kernel runs a little faster than Perl. Again, breakdown. So in that example, the hard thing that we're doing is the decompression. Decompressing files takes time, takes CPU time. But if you're compressed on disk, what time do you save? You're not waiting on I.O. So we're trading I.O. time for CPU time, or vice versa, depending on the way you think about it. So in this example up here, we're back to that uh, that bad URLs file is a list of 2,320 IP addresses and URLs from your Thread Intel group. I don't know about you guys, but this is something that I've done. This was very real world example for me. You get that uh, dump from the FBI or some other three letter agency. Hey, all this stuff is bad. Can you find it? So you go and you do your search. This is 677 minutes. How long is that in freedom units? That's 11 hours, 17 minutes. That's, that's, that takes a while. And you'll notice this is in parallel. I'm pegging 16 CPUs, 32 threads for 11 hours and 17 minutes to cross-reference that thread intel list. That's redonkulous. Capital F. This is that option to grep to save that time. So how much time did I save? 11 hours. So we went from 11 hours, 17 minutes down to 96 seconds, all by adding a dash capital F. So um, greps should be fast. Greps should feel very snappy on like a Pentium 60. So if any of you guys have a CPU that's faster than 60 megahertz, which is everyone, Grep should feel snappy. If it doesn't, disable regular expressions, get rid of that, or add that capital F, you're going to save yourself some time. One of the pieces of feedback I got from a beta version of this presentation was that, Mark, an IP address in one field is not equivalent to an IP address in another field. Uh, source and destination IP addresses are different. You have to use those differently. So what I did is I'm showing that parsing is possible with these techniques. I wrote a little utility here called print URL, and what it does is it parses out the URL from those web logs and then generates a list of the top 15 sites uh, by going through all three steps. So that's about three minutes, 45 seconds to get a list of the top 15 sites going over 750 megalogs. That's not bad. I don't put this one up here as a, wow, that's so fast. I put this up here as an example of don't think like you have to, the grep is the only thing you can do. Don't think like you have to get it all done in one step. As you're doing incident response, as you're doing searches for data, you can use these techniques uh, even through multiple steps. Quick troubleshooting side. You can, uh, what I want you guys to focus on here is this far right column, idle. This is how much CPU time is idle. So this search took, uh, let's call it about a, 45 seconds to a minute, but we're at 20% idle with, what, 30 seconds to go, 20 seconds to go? So by splitting up some of those larger input files, that enables those smaller chunks to be processed in parallel. You could have made this search uh, probably twice as fast, to be perfectly honest, just by splitting up that data a little bit more. So what started all this? 
we had a situation where our threat intel team gave us that big list of IOCs and we had to figure out what to do with it. Uh, we had to do some cross-referencing kind of stuff. Our threat intel group wanted some answers, you know, within a, an hour or two. And searching through bro logs ended up taking a long time. So we started doing this. Apparently bro is called Zeke now. Um, I don't think I'm the only one struggling with that one, so I'll probably bounce back and forth to put it politely. So, the example that we did here, this is from my home security onion sensor. This is 78,000 bro logs, uh, which is 230 gigs uncompressed, uh, stored on disk was about 16 gigs. That's 630,000 log events. Um, again, home sensor over months. This wasn't like a two-day period. Um, by the way, if you want to find out how to get blocked uh, by searching Alexa top one million sites, let me know. That's a hallway conversation. So cross-referencing all of that data with the Alexa top one million, going through all 78,000 files in serial took 3,500 minutes. It's about, what, 11 hours, I think? No, probably more than that. I don't remember. That's a lot. That's three days, isn't it? So the next thing we did, I s took my bro file. So on Security Onion, our bro files are split up by hour, right? To make it easier to search. Ain't nothing easy about searching through 78,000 files. So what I did is I wrote a script called dailyify, because I'm terrible at naming things. It is in the GitHub, which takes all of my HTTP files for one day, puts them in one big file. Takes all my DNS files, puts them in one big file. All of my uh, con logs, one big file. All of my weird files, all my X509s, puts them in big files for the day. That gets me down to 4,200 files, still about the same number of megabytes within rounding errors, same number of log events to the uh, precisely. And then going through and searching through that, we went from 3,500 minutes to 400. It's a 9x speed up, I'll take it. And that's just by getting rid of the I.O. of dealing with a lot of, large, a lot of small files. The next thing we did is I went back to those small files, but now I did it in parallel. So I still have all that I.O. to do, um, but was able to uh, take advantage of multiple CPU cores. In this case, I'm using 32 cores, um, down to 150 minutes. So we've gone from 3,500 minutes down to 150. That's huge. That's maybe still not what your boss would want, although, to be fair, we are searching through months' worth of data, but it's still a huge speed up. Think we're done? No. But wait, there's more. So now we do the large files, and we're down to 35 minutes. We drop two orders of magnitude from our search time just by using these techniques. So this is the dailyify script that I referenced before. Um, again, it's available in the GitHub, and it takes all those tiny files and puts them into bigger chunks. I mentioned that these techniques working, work with things other than just searching through log data. ClamPV, open source antivirus engine, you can use it for that. So in this case, I had about 2,000 EXEs that were, collected, that were run through the bro extract script, uh, 11 gigs worth of executables took 34 minutes to go through it all. That's not bad. I'll, you know, it's not bad. But by splitting it up into chunks, we were down to 3 minutes and 47 seconds. So it's a 10x speed up. I'll call that a win. But that's not why I showed you this example. What I really like about this example is the technique here. So I want to go through this for just a minute. There are a lot of Unix utilities where you can pass them the input files as command line parameters. That's what we're used to working with. Their Clam AV, or Clam Scan, is one of a number of Unix utilities where you can give it a file containing a list of your input files. So what I did here is I said find in the directory called extracted all files of, t all, um, yeah, all of my files, that's the dash type app, and save that in a file called list. Now, my split command here is a little weird to the point where I'm actually going to look at it. <laughs> so what we're doing is, and again, I'll start on the right-hand side, list dot is our output file name. 
list is our input file name. Dash A2D tells me that we're going to use digits in our file extension, and we're going to use two carats, or two characters to name them. And then the dash N L over 48. That's a little weird. What we're telling split is that we want to split the file into chunks. That's the technical term in the man page. We want 48 chunks, and by default, Split will split at byte boundaries, not at line boundaries. So the L divided by 48 says split at line boundaries so that we don't have half a file name on uh, different lines. Um, so if you've got any kind of Unix utility that will take a list of input file names, this weird technique on slide 45 will save, you, save your bacon. Pardon the phrase. OK, again, breakdown slide. So how you do this at home? Get the data, store the data, process the data. Any questions? Moving on. So <laughs> getting the data is pretty easy. You guys have Security Onion. You're storing your data on your super micro disk. You're sending a copy of all that data over to China. You're good to go. How do you process the data? Multiple cores and SSDs. That's what it comes down to. There are SSDs called NVMe drives. You don't really have to know what it stands for, except fast. If you think normal SSDs are fast, these are two to four times faster, depending on how much you want to spend. Um, to give an idea of how expensive these are, two terabytes of NVMe drives on a little adapter card that I've got dropped in my workstation over here is about $1,000. I would say well within the budget of most, uh, most information security groups um, to get two terabytes of incredibly fast storage. You can do about 10 gigabytes per second of read, if 10 gigabytes per second, that bytes, not bits, 10 gigabytes per second lets you watch Pulp Fiction twice per second for as long as you want to go throughout the whole day. So you can find out what happened to the watch twice per second all day long. Um, I'm a fan of the AMD stuff. They're running more cores for cheaper than Intel right now at a pretty big, uh, you get a, a price discount and more cores. Uh, so for this time of work, type of work, it works out great. Um, if you have a corporate policy, you have to buy from HP, Lenovo, Dell, whatever, just go buy an Intel Xeon and be done with it, uh, and you're going to be spending a little bit more. I am a huge fan of the metric for the price of a cup of coffee per day. When I get that email, when I have that conversation with the boss and he doesn't want to spend, you know, however many thousands of dollars for, you know, a pet project that I've got, this is the metric I use. So it used to be that you got two pieces of dry white toast and a cup of coffee for, you know, a quarter. Um, now that Jake and Elwood Blues aren't with us anymore, we go to Starbucks and you get the mocha frappe lapa ding dong that, you know, before you go pick it up, they're like, sir, you better bend with your knees. All right. Um, so coffee's gotten a little bit more expensive, and so you can make this metric work for you. Um, yeah, security appliance, I'm a huge fan of this. Um, I've, noted, I've learned that you can slap the label security appliance and get anything through change control. Okay, now we get to do live demos because what could go wrong? That's not what I wanted. Okay, there we go. Okay, perfect. So this is top that's running, and uh, up here we've got. Okay, so this window down here is running a command called SAR. So every two seconds it gives you your CPU utilization. All you want to do is really pay attention to this idle column and take a look at. Uh, how idle the this, this system is. Uh, this over here gives us our uh, disk read and write speeds for the seven different drives that we're querying, and then we've got a traditional top window in the other corner. So the first example that I will do is cross-referencing with the uh, bad URLs list. This is that list of 2,320 uh, um, IP addresses and URLs from uh, our Thread Intel group, and this does. This is a legit list. Uh, I pulled it off the internet, so if it's on the internet, it's got to be true, right? Um, 
And you can see what I want to point out over here, we're running 200, 300 megabytes per second off each of our drives. If you look at top, the thing that's taking up our CPU time is grep. So the greps, so um, we, our logs are stored on disk compressed. They're compressed with the LZ4 algorithm. And so that takes a fair bit of time to un-LZ4 them. Uh, but it is still the grep that is the slower part of our overall transaction. In other words, even though they're compressed, that's not really slowing down our log search that much. I will say the reason I had my fingers crossed, the first time I gave this demo live, we tripped the breaker. <laughs> so um, the, the <laughs> this is not a power efficient machine. I still surprised I got it through the TSA, but that's a different story. Um, so this should take uh, about two minutes or so to go through. And you can see we're already at 45, 50% idle. And this is what I was talking about. If we split up some of those large input files, uh, we're going to get our times down even lower. <laughs> what else? So now we can see we're down to three greps, two greps, uh, two LZ4s. We should be about done here soon. And do do do. So minute 41, and we've got 92 hits on that list. So in a situation like this, these would be the 92 things that we'd start to kick off some incident response, uh, gather some additional data from Bro, and start to figure out what was really going on. So the next example I want to do is just searching for uh, a website or two in particular. So what would be a good website to search for in Augusta, Georgia? Let's do georgiapeaches.com. I have no idea if that's a real thing. This should take about 45 seconds. And here what we can see is we've got much higher uh, disk I.O. rates. Um, I saw 500 megabytes per second up there before. And we see that the grep is taking inconsequential amount of time. The CPU is spending all of its time doing that decompression with the LZ4 algorithm. So in this case, that you know, compression is causing a large amount of overhead, but at the same time, we're not hitting the disk that hard. So um, these disks will do about two gigabytes per second a piece. So we've theoretically got a bunch of overhead here where we could pull uh, data off the disk faster. So what this tells me is that it's time for me to justify buying a faster CPU. <laughs> All I have to do is convince my wife of that. So yeah, 45 seconds, and apparently no one's uh, going to the georgiapeaches.com website. OK. Please? There we go. OK. So we'll skip the recorded demos. Told you I dropped two tools on you. This is my cat, Kaylee, uh, again, before and after being shaved. So Squishy Cat, uh, again, I'm terrible at naming things. I make no apologies for it. Uh, HR let me name my team the Security Analysis Center. And uh, when my consultants figured out what the acronym spelled out, it was all a good time. So anyway, uh, Squishy Cat takes data that's compressed with one of those four algorithms or is totally uncompressed data figures out how it's compressed and dumps it to standard out, just the same way CAT does, only it transparently handles uh, the d decompression. So this came about basically as I was running these various scripts. I would try and remember if I was working with gzip data, and is that zcat or gzcat or lz4cat or what? And I'm like, I don't have the mental bandwidth for this, so I wrote this little script. Again, it's on the GitHub. Uh, it's a pretty simple kind of script. So what we do here is I've got the same data set compressed with, I've got it in plain text, which is the top line, the bzip2, the gzip, the lz4, and the xz. And we run each of those through squishy cat. We get the same SHA-1 sum. I did use SHA-1 for that. Uh, yes. Um, so that is, we know that we get the same output. So totally good. It works. Uh, yay. Happy fun. Some of you guys, maybe not everyone, I don't need a show of hands, maybe sitting there thinking, this is cool and all, but there's no way I could do this at home. Maybe, again, don't need a show of hands. Um, 
So one of the pieces of feedback I got was that, Mark, not everyone could do this. I'm like, but the, the commands, they're right there. You can do this. It's no big deal. Mark, not everyone can do that. OK. OK. So grepwide was born. Grepwide is really, really simple. It takes one input file. Stick a file in your home directory called look for me. You put in look for me the things that you're searching for. One item per line, no blank lines at the bottom. You CD over to your directory containing your log files, and you run grepwide. It spiders down throughout the file system. It will follow symlinks and finds all your data files in that subdirectory. And then it searches through them for the terms that are in look for me. And it saves the output to a file called outfile in your home directory. Who thinks they could run something called grepwide? That's pretty simple, OK? What I really want you to do is be inspired. I want you to download grepwide from my GitHub and be like, dude, this is simple. I don't need to use this. So use it the first time. Start to learn these techniques. Modify grepwide. Maybe submit a you know, thing to GitHub and we can make it better. Or maybe just go and do your own thing. Um, these techniques may be intimidating. May, may, may. But they're really not that hard. Once you do it a couple times, it'll start to make sense. And it's a great way to justify your, to your boss buying a really killer workstation. So um, I, I notice I've got more time here than I expected. So uh, I'm gonna, you guys are going to get some bonus material. Uh, but first, the Linux command line from No Starch Press. I'm not plugging No Starch Press because they're a sponsor. Um, but they produce some excellent work and some things by Chris Sanders. Um, so the, <laughs> sorry, I couldn't resist. The Linux command line is a great book. It's worth checking out. Um, there's some other great stuff from them. Chris's book is, again, useful for this. Linux in a nutshell and Unix in a nutshell are incredible resources if you're not familiar with them. And what's great is that Amazon sells used books. So you can get an old copy of Unix in a nutshell or Linux in a nutshell delivered to your house. They bring it to you for like six or eight bucks. And so maybe you don't have the latest edition. Maybe it's a little bit older. Unix hasn't really changed in 20 or 30 years. So if you've got the copy that's 12 years old rather than 11 years old, you're good to go. Uh, and a uh, plug for hum Humble Bundle. If you can't say it, still go there. Uh, they produce book bundles. They have No Starch Press bundles. They have O'Reilly bundles. They change like every week or two. So you've got to sign up for the mailing list and keep up to date uh, to figure it out. And they've got awesome, awesome stuff. So. I'm contractually obligated at this point to ask for questions. So if anyone has any questions, please try and keep it relevant to the material. Uh, I do know a little bit about biology, but not much. So questions? Yeah. <laughs> I will not be covering how to fold a fitted sheet. <laughs> Next question. Yeah. So the question is about using GPUs. GPUs are awesome for parallelization. Uh, there are libraries out there to help you program the GPUs pretty easily. Um, I did not want to get into writing C code. Um, so I think there's probably some areas to be explored there, but I didn't really go into it. Yeah. One more time. Uh, yeah, there should have been plenty of examples using parallel as well as exargs. You what? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, check out the slides; it's all there. And yeah, parallel is awesome. The link? Yes, yeah. GitHub.com/slash MarkJX, and then the um, project is called Search 2018. And then from there, there's the PDF. Yes, MarkJX01 is my Twitter account. MarkJX is the uh, GitHub account. Oh. 
Oh. <laughs> Go me. Yep, yeah, the, apparently the footer is wrong on each and every slide. That's awesome. Awesome. Yes. Okay. Thank you for pointing that out. Sorry, I missed it when you first mentioned it. What else? Do I have time left? Five? Oh, okay, so we got time to drop some bonus material. Oh, so I don't have, I'm way over then. Okay. I'm good. Okay, one more question, he says. Nothing? Um, quick plug. Oh, yeah, go ahead. GitHub.com, MarkJX. Search 2018. What's that? Uh, the blue one here is the correct link. Apparently, the MarkJX01 is incorrect. Yeah. Yeah, MarkJX01 is my Twitter account. Feel free to follow me. Um, there, uh, yeah, okay. Anything else? Okay, thank you very much.